Good evening, everyone. Actually, didn't plug in code. Okay. Okay. So, good evening. Welcome to a Wednesday night class. We're going to do two things today. First of all, as we discussed in the last in the last class, we want to do. A simple debit and, and a debit and credit for the unearned revenue. Uh, we said Poloni Almoni had given us a thousand dollars, and he only had three hundred seventy-five dollars to pay. So he gave us he prepaid us six twenty-five, and it seems like he will not be using our services before July. So if we're going to make a report, that's going to go for half of this year, for this fiscal year, for the month of, through June. We don't want to have that we received income. We have to defer the income to the next period, which will be in July. That's one debit entry. The second thing we're going to do today is primarily we're going to work on the reports. So it's the same hand that we had in last class. We were holding by step six, which are several reports. And we could do, we could do more reports than are listed there. <clears throat> So the debit and credit I will demonstrate and the reports, like I said, I didn't get much feedback last time, but perhaps I'll be narrating and you could look at your own. Uh, you could be doing the reports in real time as I instruct you. Uh, if you're more comfortable, you could watch mine, watch the way I'm doing it, then have the rerun on the, on the, when you watch the recording. So, incidentally, I will teach you one more feature in QuickBooks because I keep on getting always asked what what is the password. And the truth is, you don't need to use my password. You can make you could change the password to the password that you'll remember. And the criteria is that it has to be a complex password. That means it has a capital letter, it has a has a number, and it has a a special character. Where do we do the passwords? So you go to company, right? The company is what directs the, the, the is, controls the file for the company. It's not vendors, it's not employees, we're not doing bills. And we have right here down the center, we have something called, what does this say? Okay, I'm gonna say on the company, set up users and passwords. And we could change our password. We could set up a user. There's a um, time that you have someone in the office which you want to give them a limited viewing in your company's finances. So you want them to enter the bills that you receive, maybe to make some payments, but they don't need to see all the payroll information. They don't need to see all the client info and etc. Those are settings you could do when you set up users. Right now we're going to change your password. And what you have to do is you have to enter the current password. And you could change the username as well. Right now, the default, you know, is admin. But you could change the, you could change the username to your username. You could change the password. Right now, we have info with a capital I, the number one, and the symbol for at. And we do it. But you could change the password. And as it says here, these are the recommendations. They should have at least seven characters, including one number and one uppercase letter. 
I guess you don't have to have the special character, but it, uh, could be, it's a good idea. Anyway, so that uh, should take care in the future before you leave the file tonight, change the password. So if in case you get stuck without being able to go to the file and you will be able to reach me, you'll be out of luck. So change your, change your password today. Okay, that's, this is uh, taking care of some homekeeping. Regarding the debit and credit, we see we've got the customers. Now we all know by now we can go to customer center. We know we can go to the customer icon. Um, that will take us there as well. And we see here, um, Plony Money has a negative receivable for $625. The way I'm going to take care of it today is um, because if we make our balance report, let's see, we, have, we make a report. And I would go down to company and financial. And I would go to my balance sheet. Say, so for those who are watching, I'm going, I'm slowing down. You go to the drop down from reports, you go to the company and financial, and you go to the balance sheet. And we're gonna look at the report for this year as of 6.17. So we have here, accounts, if you open the accounts receivables, we have um, the people that, that we collect from. So obviously we don't have to collect them from Plony Almoni. So he is not on the report from account receivables. If we go to the profit and loss standard report. So again, it's not the second section of the balance sheet, but it's a top section called profit and loss. And we look at the income, for, let's say for the year. And we go to sales income. Again, so it's not gonna necessarily show up on the report right now, but if we, if we go into, let's see, what is this here? Okay, so basically, um, I, 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 uh, I correct myself. If we made a sales receipt, we recognized the income for Plony Amoni for the thousand dollars and we didn't really earn all that income, then you would make the, you would make the, that adjusting entry. Right now we have Plony Amoni's uh, income, whether it's on the cash basis or on the cool basis, it does not show up this thousand dollars that he paid. We see the 375 that we earned in invoices. As we said, how does accrual basis work? Accrual basis works that when you make an invoice, then you earn the money. We didn't make an invoice for that 625. So we didn't earn the money, it's not showing up in the accrual. As well as in the cash basis, Plony Money did pay us for 375. He paid up the invoice that you see over here. So so we'll, we'll, put the, we'll put the debit and credit on hold, on hold for today. Let's start with the reports. I said we're gonna go to the report center. So report center. Okay, now that we have a company and we have many types of, of uh, sales, bills, et cetera, now we wanna analyze the company's performance in various ways. So, one, the QuickBooks gives us um, pretty much standard, um, what's it called, pre, 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 pre with, with icons, they give us standard types of reports that people may want to have. And many times you see, in the, they're giving you a choice, they're giving you, if it's, you want the month to date, you want the fiscal year to date. And these are, this is the standard and this detail and this profit and loss year to date comparison. So let's take one at a time. What would happen when we open up this month to date, which is June, June was a, uh, we our income pretty much is from May and from June. I would click on the month to date. 
we would have a report of sales income of $375. This is all the money that we made in this month. And this is, a, this is probably just from pulling the money. This is the income that we had, you know, for Pilkos Tadis doing a web design job, the double quote on it. All the sales and all the consulting that we made is not in this month. But if you look at the report going down, you'll see we have depreciation expense for $100, a negative. As you recall, that's what happens when you do a, a reversing entry because we put in a $100 depreciation at the end of May. That's to adjust for that period. And in order that we shouldn't double count the depreciation, right? We say the whole year is 240. And just through the first five months is $100. So we, put, so we put a negative on the first date of June 1st. So like this, it would net itself out. Now, that if you make a report through May, as I'll, as I'll show you in a moment, you'll have the $100 depreciation. If you make the whole year, you'll only have 240. That is because we wipe out that 100 on the 1st of June. Let's see. Double click on the 100. And this should be in your quick, and everyone who has their file, it should be the same. Um, assuming you, we did that uh, adjusting entries two classes ago. You see here, this is the 3R, this is the reverse entry that we did on June 1st. Okay, so now that we confirm that, I'm going to close that back out. Homeowners Association fees, $2,500. This is when Ruben decided he is joining and making the rental property. So in the, in the scheme of things, you would, you, would, you would look down to the list and say, one second, I'm paying Home and Owners Association 2,500. I'm paying property tax 2,700. I have an office expense of $1,000. So this sounds ridiculous. I'm already having a, a loss just in this month of $8,000. And that's a little bit uh, premature because um, it's entirely possible that he has a plan in Ju July and August that he's going to rent out the bungalow for $12,000. Six thousand dollars a month, and he's been, he's not going to have this expense. In addition, he prepaid this thousand dollars for rent, five hundred dollars a month, right? We said we have a we actually we we have a rent expense that we put back. Remember, we prepaid fifteen hundred dollars last year. Then we realized in May, then we realized five thousand five hundred was for May itself, so we had to undo the. The fifteen hundred dollars we, we had a prepaid rent. All right, if, I, if I was going now to um, the period of May, which is um, May first through oh five thirty one, which is May, you'll see that we this is the we had a bill of fifteen hundred, but we, uh, we um, rent expenses fifteen hundred dollars, but then we w turned around. And we made a credit of the expense. We undid the expense of a thousand that became prepaid rent, right? If you double click on this thousand, you'll see in general journal three, let's go all the way into it. We created an asset called prepaid rent. Prepaid rent is a debit. And, rent, and we undid the expense, right? The expenses go up on the debit side. We credited that expense. But then we came back into into June, into our current period, and we put back the thousand dollar expense. So that's what he's going to pick up in June and July. He's, he's using up the rent. He might decide, you know what, I could use my summer home after the summer as my office, and I'm not going to have my five hundred dollars a month rent. I already have the home, the rental. So there, you don't have to get um, jump to conclusions when you see only one month view of a report because it doesn't give you the full picture. That's what we're going to close out of this month report. And we're going to go to the next report called, um, not only prep and loss stand, there'll be a detail, and it will give us the fiscal year to date. So it's, a, it's two changes. It's not just giving us the, the total, it's going to give us a breakdown, and it's going to give us the whole year. So let's see. Now you can see already income is not only $325, $375, our income is actually 3,500. Yeah, we did have cost of goods, uh, expense of 33, we're going down. So we see now our advertising and promotion. We see our interest expense. 
interested, that's the short interest, this is the office supplies. And you'll see that we had, because on the left side we have a negative income of $7,200, which is more or less not much worse off than we were just in this month. But we also know that we have, um, we have assets, we have, we have houses, we have uh, supplies, we have a copier. If you only look at the month, you wouldn't know that we have a copier that's worth $1,200. You could look at your balance sheet, you might find the copier there. But going forward, we have two months of expenses paid, we have a rent paid, and we could just sit there, consult all day, we could make sales, we could do web design, and it's possible that just in the, the second half of June, from today, in July, and in August, where we, not, we have no more increase in rent, we will be able to uh, have a lot more income. Anyway, this is just showing you what you can do with your reports, because your analysis, Let's take the next report. It's called Profit and Loss Year Today Comparison. Now, <clears throat> this is not, when you see numbers, don't get scared right away and say, oh, well, wow, this is for accountants. Because someone who's running his business wants to have an idea of what's coming and going. And if you take, let's take the last one on this page, because this is going to give us a profit and loss with a previous year comparison. We know last year we only made $70 that we know. Let's see. So we have to change the date in the bottom to, um, we'll put the R. So we're going to have the whole year, because if we make the comparison from January 1 to July, to, to June 17, 2020, the comparison will be from last year, also in the first, to date, fiscal year to date. And if you double click on it, you'll actually have zero income from last year, which is not true. That's change the date, you put an R for a year, and we'll see all of a sudden a $70 will pop up. There were no expenses last year that we could see in the report. We had a setting here that we have the, we wanna see the difference in dollar change or percentage change. Some people like to use the percentage as a, as a gauge. You know, we increase sales by X percent, you know, 5,000% sounds like a big number. Really what it is, it's only 50 times as much like 100%, 1,000 is 10 times an increase, and 5,000 is a 50 time increase. And that's pretty much, you know, uh, 50 times 70 is, it would get you to $3,500. And we see over here, the breakdown of the cost of goods. Okay, and we see our net income for the year. It shows uh, here a, a negative of minus 246. Because again, this, this adds in new expenses, which is after today. We're gonna to have a depreciation expense. We'll have, uh, we, we're, incur we're, we're bringing up now, not the $500 from one month of rent, not the $1,000 from two months rent. We're bringing all the rent, we're bringing, now we have the payroll. If you notice, now that I did the whole year, we're recognizing the expense, the payroll expense, which is not only for the June 19 check, which we didn't have before, right? Before we only had the 17 check, the, the, the check from 6.5. Now we have a payroll, payroll expense for 6.19. You also have the payroll check for 6.26. That's why when you go on the year, it's not being 7,200, we're increasing it to 9,200. So you'll see from report to report, it's giving you different information. And that, you know, based on the time period that you're having the, that income and expense, obviously the numbers are subject to change. Okay, so that is for our profit and loss and uh, when we looked at the, at the general company. Then you can go down the list by customers and receivable. And again, feel free to scroll down and see the dozens of different types of reports. You can have a customer phone list, a customer contact list. Then you have customer balance. So let's click on the customer balance for a second. Okay, so if, if, you, if you're on your own um, QuickBooks file, uh, you will be in the report center and the, and the customer section of report center and we're looking at the customer balance line. If you would look at the sum in, summary, double click on it and you see who owes us money and you'll see only Mrs. Cook, Mrs. Gabay, Mr. Gabay and Yanko. Those are the three people that owe us money to do today. 
Okay, that we, we, we got what we came for. Now we can, we can go out of this one. Let's see. Uh, transaction list by customer. So we want to know how did we earn that money? And not this month to date, we're going to change it to this fiscal year. But so now we're on the, on the far right of the customer balance reports and the transaction list by customers. And here you can get analysis, you can see, we have um, the people who we who gave you service, but that's a transaction. So it's not just a person, a summary of each customer, but we have um, the breakdown of transactions from each customer. We have undeposited funds. The reason why there's a check, you'll notice a check in the, it's clear this would happen when we reconcile. When you reconcile, then it means a clear to the bank. And people ask me, why do we reconcile? Well, we want to make sure that the bank is the same, has the same information as us. We want to make sure that there are no other monies left the bank that we don't know of. Maybe you have someone just writes out checks and he doesn't, he forgot to enter it in the QuickBooks and we'll start bouncing checks. So you have to make sure when you see the bank, make sure that if you're missing a check, you put it into your QuickBooks. And if, and if it didn't belong in your QuickBooks because you, you don't recognize that check, you don't recognize the signature, then you will, and you believe that what you had in QuickBooks is correct, then you investigate, you know, possible fraud that someone, you know, just copied a check or made a withdrawal from your bank, etc. Okay, let's close out the transaction list by customer. Now we're going to go back to the top of the customer section because we scroll down. And we have, I told you last time, we have um, aging, the, the aging summary. What's the aging summary we discussed last time? As of today, we want to know what is our, our aging invoices. Invoices that are unpaid for a long time run, uh, you know, they're, no, they could be, they're delinquent. They run a bigger risk of remaining unpaid. So you, you obviously want to collect all your money, but you should put a special emphasis on the, on the accounts that are more than 30 days overdue. Uh, perhaps you might consider after 60 days offering a little, you know, when you, get, when you finally get the person to answer the phone, you offer them a little discount for paying today. You know, we'll take $10, $10 off and pay us $1,000. You'll be happy to get, you know, you know to uh, re be relieved and get your 990 You know, obviously it's a cost you to $10 that you thought you would earn, but you'd be more secure collecting. And you see here, we have accounts that are up to 30 days aging. We have up to 60 days. As you see, Mrs. Cook, you know, school, the, the Mrs. Cook is closing down and the school's finishing next week and she's skipping town and you're not gonna collect your $140. So you should work on that. That's the aging detail from the customer. And you can look at it as a graph. You know, people like to see pictures of the parts of the pie. You know, you see what 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 section of your of your uh, of your um, income is for the past thirty days, and you compare it to the thirty days before. And you say, "Wow, this business is booming this month, and it's only June 17. and you know, it should continue to go that way." Okay, let's close that out. Now we're gonna to go to sales. And you have sales by, we're gonna to go to sales by customer detail. And again, we're gonna change it to the year, this fiscal year. So now we're on the third, in the report center in the third section on the left called sales. And we are two from the left called sales by customer detail. And before, when we were in the customer section, we saw the detail of transactions of each invoice. What was the total of the invoice? And um, this is already tells you also the item. If you look down, you can see what you did, not just the transaction, but you also see the items. You saw the quantity, six, uh, nine hours of, uh, of bookkeeping and four hours of uh, general consulting and web design. So you could get a report of the quantity of items. Now, this is not really such a useful number 240.5 at the bottom because that's a total of not only services, but it's also a total of 
of cost of goods of books that you sold, you have your Megillah Shrus, 151. And not only it's a total of that, but it's, it's mixed together. It's 240 is the total quantity, but it's, a, it's like a mix of many types of items and services. But, but if, you were, if your business is primarily service, you'll say, wow, we, we, we pushed 240 units of service. You, don't, you still don't have a report per item. That we will do, that's an report in itself. If you go down to, you'll be able to get the sales by item. You'll know if you want to get a report of how many total hours of service. Here, sales by item. There we go. It's in the sales. Then you get a, a more useful. Say, wow, web design. Let's, let's, look, let's add last month. So we're, we're going to add an M again. I'll get this to last month. Now you can see we have services. This is a, this is a nice breakdown for you, for a, for a company to, to look. Your sales by item. You have Magillus Gross, we sold a total of 252. And the total month, dollar amount that brought us in to, was, it uh, should have been $342. Uh, we had 35. This is actually the inventory cost, right? It's not the, we have over here the bookkeeping, we have 11.5 hours of booking, bookkeeping total. And if you see the bookkeeping is picking up, you might want to consider hiring another bookkeeper because if you could do bookkeeping for, um, in this case, we just say charging 30 and you're going to pay your bookkeeper $20, you have a $10 profit. Obviously, there's a bigger markup in the web design where you only pay $40 to Tim Custodius, but you're billing it out at $75, right? You see here, the average price that you bill it is $75. That's the, that's the average bill. The average housekeeping is $20, general consulting is $100. So you could bring on a consultant who, you know, um, you'll pay him $50 an hour and they have a $50 markup. So your markups on the $100 item could be $50. The markups on your $75 item will be $35. And the markup on your $30 item is $10. So you don't turn away money. As long as you have people that could work at no extra cost to you, maybe they're going to work from home. And you're gonna clean off ten dollars off the top, you know. So you, you become like a broker, and you make this ten dollars on each on each level, and you make the fifty dollars on each level. Housekeeping, you make only five dollars. You have to pay fifteen dollars minimum wage in New York City, but you 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 building it up at twenty. So these are these are all very useful ways of analyzing your costs and 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 the revenue streams that are coming in, how to expand your business. Okay. That was, so again, what we just did was sales by item summary. You also have, if you really wanted, you could go sales by item detail. And I'll give you a little bit more. You'll see who did what. You can look at your Megillus Rus, and you can see who bought it. You know, you have the by you can look, you can see where it's coming, where it's going. And you have the total inventory items that you moved out. You cleared out 152 of MR leaving you 48, you cleaned out the 187. Here you see your bookkeeping. Who's your bookkeeping? You know, it's not always good to know. I mean, it's, it's good to know that you have 11 and a half hours of bookkeeping, but when you have customers who take a large amount, you know, you, wanna, you don't want to hire someone and all of a sudden you lose a big client and then you have a, 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 an employee not having to do work. So you might want to increase a, a number of these smaller clients to make a balance, you'll add them, you know, let's look for three more customers who give us two and a half hours a month. And therefore, if a customer like that would leave, it doesn't make such a big dent in the company. If plenty of money skips town, all of a sudden we'll have a drop in $270 of income just on that line item. Obviously we still have his money, but that's a different story. And then we have the web design. We have, wow, 12 hours of web design. So maybe Pinkus Tadras is going into business. You know, he's going to have many more, hour, more hours to, 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 to uh, work. Maybe he can have someone else. So that is the sales item by detail. And for the most part, each report gives you a little twist, a little angle. You could customize every general report by the day, by the month. You know, you run a report, you can have a favorite. Your market's favorite. If you know that your company, you like to have 
this sales by item, it's a very good analysis. So make it favorite. Then it will show up under your favorites. We have uh, one tab here called favorites, right? If I would click on this uh, sales by item detail, make favorites. Okay, so now it's not ready anymore because I have favorites. Let's see, they show up customized favorites. If I look in them, I probably should show up over here at our report under the report section. From the vendors, oh, let's go all the way down. Do you know how many menus there are on the top? You think it's only a few across a few down there are dozens and dozens of items that you could do and we're going all the way down to reports let's see if we have detail reports anyway but you get you get the idea you'll probably find it somewhere here your um you can add to the to the to your reports on the right side but let's go over now to uh, vendors and payables same thing we're going to look at the ap the ar is short for accounts receivables ap is short for account payable and just like we had a bill tracker the bill tracker could also give us an idea right the icon bill tracker on the top gives us an idea of what we're outstanding it says you have unpaid bills so 204 dollars we have we paid 1850 so similarly you have your ap aging detail let's double click on that one but we don't want to, we have it as of today. Today means what's total outstanding. You see over here, the 604. That's the number that you have in the bill tracker. Bill tracker does the same thing. Bill tracker tells us we have unpaid 604. That's your account payables. Bill, um, your accounts payable is not going to bring up your 1850. That's gone. That's paid. That could be in the vendors, in the vendors reports, in the, in the bills, you'll find what you paid which will probably be the sum total of 604 and 1850, which is like 24 or 54, probably your total bills. The number 554 is just, is, is included. It's in the same tab as 604. The difference is 554 is overdue and $50 is not yet due because we didn't even enter a bill yet for that. Okay, so now we saw here what our accounts payable is. Again, um, I'll look at the Q&A if so, if, if, People need clarification, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, I'm gonna attempt to put on actually the audio at nine o'clock today to, um, to enable people to ask questions. Um, if there's anything or anything in, the, in, the, in any area that we covered so far that you need elaboration, please do not hesitate. Okay, so that that was so that's the accounts payable. There's nothing more to it. it was just you can make a graph, you can see a picture. Accounts payable is a small is just a small number. It's just it's a part of bills that was not yet paid, and you'll see it broken down by Tom Edison, Carlos Farm, etc. Okay, let's close out the accounts payable. Let's go back to the purchases. What are our total purchases? Um, purchases by vendor. Okay, purchase by vendor. Let's go into that. Purchases by vendor. Um, let's, let's take the first report. And let's open up for the year. Let's see what's, what happened this year. So purchases is actually, uh, as it, as it uh, the name tells us, it's what we buy for the resale. You purchase, it's not obviously you go to a store and to purchase supplies and use it, but that's not what QuickBooks does. Purchases, if you look in the chart of accounts, is a cost of goods. When does it become a cost of goods? It becomes a cost of goods when you actually sell it, although it's in your inventory until you sell it. And purchases is what are the items that I bought for resale? And that's the MR or MH, however you, um, by, by the company, you have the Christ Farm, but you have a TLS and the MR. That's the purchases. But if you want to know what is your cost by vent, purchased by vendor, okay, it's again, it's, gonna, it's actually um, vendor, it's going to be the same thing. It's a summary, it's even less. Uh, right? It's not, it's, it's a summary is not even going to give you the item. Summary gives you the, just quick. 
the line, the, the company and the total. But if you want to know which report will tell me all my bills, that would be by vendors and payables. And not, not the, what's it called? Not with, not with the AP aging. AP aging is only what's unpaid and that's so forth. If you would look at transaction list by vendor, there we go, transaction list by vendor, by the year, that should probably give us the whole $2,400, $2,454. Let's see. We go take the whole report. Um, it seems like it's not even giving us a total. Let's see, let's go, let's take the report. You have Amazon, you have Ami, you have Khan Edison, you have the okay. You have the uh, mass paper, you have Opus Depot, you have everything, but without a total. You can see transaction by vendor with no total. It's, I find it interesting, but that's the way in this report, QuickBooks runs it. They'll give you a, a buy vendor but without, a, without a total. Let's go out of that report. So unpaid bills, we, we, again, we looked at accounts payable, that was 604. Would unpaid bills match that? Let's see, unpaid bills today is 604. So unpaid bills is another way of calling AP aging. The difference is AP aging gives us our bills by what's overdue, one to 30 days, 30 to 60 days. Unpaid bills is not worried about the time. Some people are not concerned. They give you the aging actually in the side tab over here. It's 25 days or 13 days. And this is how many days it's um, overdue actually. Not how many days, I believe not how many days it's 5.13 to today. So it's uh, with the assumption that it was due to uh, the due date was 523. It's 25 days from the due date. But if you look at the regular aging report, it will be from an uh, invoice, which is 30 to 60 days. Time Edison and National Grid will be on the report in 30 to 60 days. Um, I hope um, so. This, how um, I have your um, Javi is asking, how did we get? All these charts, reports, when the, again, um, I'm not sure your question is how we get the reports. We get the reports from QuickBooks. We click uh, on different tabs and different types of reports and QuickBooks puts together the report for us with the instructions. You can memorize reports as well. Uh, the, what do we do with the reports? It's just different ways of analyzing the business. Um, what's go, you know, where can you trim expenses? How could you streamline the income that is not such of a lag from when you, when you provide the service until you get it? In this case, we're giving like a miniature version of a company doing several thousand dollars of, of, of sales, but you can have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then all these things, every line item uh, means much more. If I would look now at the, the, the jobs, time and mileage, this is where we do the work and we'll look at the profitability. This is profitability detail. This is a very interesting thing. This is where you could see what do I really make or all the, what I was explaining before that you sell out items at one price and you, uh, and, and you pay and it costs you something else. Well, we take, you, could, you take it by the job. Let's say you look at Polony and Loni. That's what I decided to pick. Good. This is called a job. Right, it's not, it's not by the item, it's by the job. So take a job. Tony Money is considered a job. And we see here, we make our firm probably uh, 200. Well, the cost was 220, 290. That's what, that's what the cost was, right? Because $200 was a check to uh, Pincus Tadris. Uh, we, 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 withheld, we withheld some taxes, but the check was for two, two, $200. And it cost us an additional $22.90 in taxes. What does that cost for Tony and Money? So revenue is $270. Uh, we got $400 for GC. Here it doesn't accurately give us a real picture because we don't show the cost for the bookkeeping and the consulting, right? Because we only tie the timesheet to the, to the web design. But let's say you had a consultant who was building you $50. So then your $400 of revenue would also show what a cost of $200. If you are building out bookkeeping at, at, two, at $30, but it costs you 20, you would have $180, 
right, of bookkeeping costs. So the way this report shows us, it would think that you were profiting $822 off Tony Amoni. This is a valuable customer. You made a lot of money off him. Well, it's true, he is a valuable customer. He spent over $1,045. This is the amount, the revenue you get from him. But like I just said, you have to add the appropriate costs for what did it cost you to provide that booking service or what did it cost you to provide that general con uh, consultations? But you still made over $400 from him, so treat him well. So that's how you would look at one customer. Um, let's look at item profitability, right? It's not by the job, but again, by the item. And you can see what are we making on each item? I think we, we did something similar to this, but you'll see you have your cost of MR when you, this takes the cost of cost of goods, what we actually sold, not what's in inventory, what we made it off. This is the $342 is what we received, right? The revenue that we received against the actual cost of the items we sold and the difference, the dollar difference. So, that's one of the things also it puts a dollar sign on the top to tell us about the dollar to make it less cluttered below. If you have a bunch of dollar signs, it will be swimming around. So it'll give you a dollar sign higher up. And we see that we made, in our services, we made $2,700. In our inventory, cost of goods, we made $471 for a total revenue of $3,200. Okay, uh, I want to do uh, one more um, report over here. And again, this is so much more, you can, so much you can do and we can possibly cover uh, all every type of report in any way. But we, we had before, uh, okay, uh, the, we had employees and payroll. And this is payroll detail review. We'll take, we'll take that one, this calendar year to date. So this is, Again, report center, scrolling down the last side to employees and payroll. And we'll go to employee detail review, but not calendar to the year to date. We want to take the whole, the whole calendar year. So just to, see, to get an idea. Now this is a very busy, busy report because it breaks everything down from federal withholdings, medical employee, employee detail. Not, and this is not always a report you want to look at. Right, you have Mr. Spine, one whole section, Pinchas Tadras, a whole section, Yaakov Fishbein. And now you could appreciate why sometimes you say, no, don't give me the detail, just give me the, give me the summary. I wonder what it's costing me. And that's why I'm gonna go back to the payroll summary, which is to the left of that. And you just get a breakdown of three nice smooth charts, one down to Mr. Spine, uh, we know it costs us $300, which we're told is 277. Um, let's, let's actually let's, let's do this for the year or so. So, um, the, 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 yeah, the month is fine. So, you have her, Mrs. Mrs. Fine is actually costing nine hundred dollars because she's getting three checks in the month of June. She got six five, uh, six five, six twelve, six nineteen, six twenty, eight, twenty six. But the start has got his two hundred dollars, and you also see the rates. You see very neatly. She got sixty hours. It's a total, it's 20 a payroll and uh, at $15 a rate. So this payroll summary is actually a very neat, in this, in this case, you say you would rather get the payroll summary than the payroll detail. In, in, in the items, you might wanna see the detail rather than the summary. So there's a trade-off. And you have a total of five units of those Tadras, 60 units of Mrs. Vine, and then you have Dr. Fishbine, we see his net pay and you actually see the total net, um, net pay is uh, $2,700. So this payroll summary act doesn't, sh if you see the column on the top is only giving us the employee, right? And, and this is the employees is at 900, 200 and 2000. If you, if you take the, the pay, the what's it called? The, not by employee, but the total only, let's see, it, it rearranges the, the report differently. 
right? Before we, we show, show columns, you want to see every employee in its own column, right? You, there's how you, different ways, there's so many ways you could sort this even, and which way is the better. So here, the first we had, we sort a column for each employee. If you want to have just a regular total, you'll see salary. The one person, we know is in salary is Mr. Fishbein, who is clerical, that's Mrs. Fine. It doesn't give you the name because it's not, uh, Nagay at this in, in this particular in this particular um, portrait view of a report. You can also okay. So that's the and this payroll summary is only giving you the, the 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 again the employee part of the of the payroll. It doesn't give you the true cost of payroll, which you know is more. Um, now all these reports are exportable. Okay, this is one thing which we should do before we, you could print them out. You could save them as PDF, assuming you have a PDF writer on your computer. You save as PDF and it's gonna bring up a place where to save the report. You could have, uh, you could email it. You could email it as an Excel file. You could email it as a PDF file. Or you just export it to Excel. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause here for a moment on the, uh, the reports and then let's see if there are any questions and answers. We were moving around quite a bit, but you can see the various reports, various things that come out of it. One, oh, we didn't do the inventory report. That was one we skipped over. And this is valuation Inventory valuation detail. Let's take it for the year. And here we see our cost when we brought in items. We see here the quantity. We got two orders of 100 to say from McGill's Rust. We sold that 151. We sold that one. It tells us exactly what's in hand. And in this report, you see how the average cost. This is how you understand how QuickBooks works. We said they work with the perpetual inventory system. And there's FIFO, LIFO, perpetual, and then there's a third, part, a fourth type called specific item where it doesn't change. So let's put the um, FIFO in short is first in, first out. LIFO is last in, first out. And that, that makes a difference if the prices keep on changing on you, as it did here. Perpetual means the average. So when we have a bill of a dollar a piece and the total asset is $100, then we have a bill of 50. So now the total of the 150 is $150. Then automatically it resets our, our average cost to 75 cents. Um, Right, you had, if you had the, um, see right away, you had 100 at 100, cost $100, which is a dollar a piece, the asset's 100. Buy 100 for $50 because it was 50 cents a piece. Now you have 200 on hand. Now, because you have an asset value of 150, it divides it by 75. Then if you go and make, you start selling items, your cost of goods is 75. What would happen if in the interim, in between your first and second order, you made a sale, then you would have sold some items at a dollar, right? That would have been the, the in this case, it would be first in, first out, but that's actually the cost, the cost of a dollar a piece. Now, if you sold 50 of them, you have 50 at a dollar, and you get in more items. So what is your cost now? One way is you can keep on saying, the next 50 that I sell is still a dollar. Right, that's the first in, first out. Whatever, until I sell my first hundred, my cost will be a dollar. The second theory is no, now we take a pause and we switch over. The ones you bought now are 50 cents. So now, even though you started selling some at a dollar, right now, what you're selling costs you 50 cents. QuickBooks doesn't do that. QuickBooks, I mean, in the default, in the inventory, it does perpetual, which is it always resets the total asset to the average. So if you, it could have been now you have an average cost of 80 cents, of 90 cents, all depending on how many $1 items you sold already against how many 50 cents you bought. 
maybe your average will be 70 cents now or 60 cents because the first you, when, when you didn't sell any and you have 200, then everything you sell 75 cents. Once you got rid of a couple $1 items, now the average cost is less. It's like 70 cents or 68 cents or 65 cents. So this is how you would see the valuation in the report as it comes in. Um, that is, I believe, what I'll do, will be it for the report, so at least for today. We may, we may do something another time and see if we have questions. And what I could do also next time is that we're going to have, a, I'm, I'm going to give Mr. Shem over the weekend, like um, 20, 25 questions that you can look at. We'll do some polling in class next time. And we'll, we'll discuss what was your right, what were the right answers, what were the incorrect answers. And we could do a few more of the preferences. There are many, many preferences here which we go through or in whatever we don't cover, you could do it yourself. Let me first get a question here. So Sam is asking about, uh, could you do five falafel and QuickBooks also? In the newer, I believe in the newer version of QuickBooks, do you have that in the preferences? Let's see, we'll go into inventory. Right, the preferences, uh, inventory, uh, items in inventory. And they say when you, when you, um, advanced inventory settings, right? Um, so they have your FIFO and multi location, you know, because it's possible that it's not, you can, it's not just the same because if, what happens if you get two locations? One location got items for $1. And the second location got the, the 50 cents item. So are you gonna say your average is 75 cents now and any item you sell 75 cents? Or the truth is whatever came to this store cost you a dollar. Whatever came to that store cost you 50 cents. So you could track, if, if you would be tracking by class, you would have each class recognizing its own cost and, 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 the, and, and its own revenue. Unit of measure and able. Uh, no, this is not, it's not there. Let's see when the, so right now the advanced option is not here. It's not enabled. My preferences, no personal. I've, I've looked look at that. I, th I think there is a way to make uh, the, the, the force QuickBooks to recognize other ways. There also is adjusting you have in the, um, if you would enable, so we have, we have a file view list, favorites, accountant. You could make a tab drop down, which is inventory. That's, that's in the, in the cost where you have in the view. Where is this now in the, in the um, yeah, in the preference. Yeah, yeah, you have an icon bar and you could edit what, the, the the menu tab of course what you're gonna have there so I'm gonna get I'm gonna I'm gonna look get back get back to you on that item was this cotton to me favorite cut I customize favorites so these are available there under under favorites on the customized favorites that gives you the the menu items that go across the top and for, for example for the lists you have these type of items. You have for accountant, you have this type. And you have, there's an inventory option as well. You could, you could uh, and, and add to the list. Inventory activities. You can adjust value on hand. And that probably that's where you would adjust the value from the inventory. You also have it under On the, it's in the item list. And you go into the inventory item, let's take a TLS. Okay, so it's the same, the unit of measures is the same question. This is, okay, so We'll leave that. This is for a, a more an advanced um, class. Let's see what other question we have over here. Okay. 
Okay, so so Rach has a question. If you're recording things not in order, it makes a difference. Well, it doesn't make a difference how you record it because what really makes a difference is the date. So let's say um, I recorded um, a sale from a later date before I put in a bill from an earlier date. So initially, the, the report will come up with a different cost of goods. But when I put in the earlier bill, then retroactively, it's going to readjust what the true story is. It changes narrative. It's the same thing if you have account balance and you forgot to enter a deposit. By going into the deposit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us what the real account balance was for that date. Doesn't mean the, the fact that you didn't enter it yet at the bank doesn't change the fact that there really, really is a higher uh, balance or a same thing with a check. If you, just because you didn't record the check doesn't mean the money didn't go out of account. So yes, if you, if you don't, if you don't, if you only do partial work, if you only put in sales, but you don't put in the bills, you're going to have the wrong cost of goods because you're, you're all feeding off the original, um, the original um, invoices. Then you might argue, well, in my case, it doesn't make a difference because since I was FIFO, all the sales have to go off the original bill anyway. But once you go later on and you put on the bill, which will predate one of your sales, then if you didn't specifically have FIFO and QuickBooks, it's not going to work that way. It's going to undo because it's going to adjust as an earlier day, the bill, and it'll adjust the, quant the, the valuation as of an earlier date. Um, I hope that was somewhat understood. Okay. Is, is, is there anyone who wants to ask a question by audio? We'll, we'll, uh... So uh, I unmuted someone who wants to talk or oh, someone raised their hand. Until someone else raised their hand, I could go back into their preferences and we'll go through some more. A few more of those preference items. Okay, let's close this down. Okay, we started last time going through, we remember I enabled prompt to assign classes. And that's why we kept on getting that error the other day when we were, and we're making checks and we weren't saying where the checks are going to. So for now, I'll undo the, you could undo the prompt to assign classes and you won't get that error. What, again, what was the purpose of classes when you want to track revenue and, um, or expenses cost by location. If you have a chain of stores that are owned by one company, now again, some people have each company, each location is its own entity. But if you have one business and you have separate locations, you could, you could track your expenses and your revenue by location. So even if you can have one bank account and you have one master account, that's fine, you have one bank, but you'll see the deposits and the income and the customers are attached to certain location by class. And here's what I told you also, you have if transactions are 30 days in the past, it gives you a warrant, you, um, you ask it to warn you or you could turn it off. The assumption is that usually you're not more than three days to overdue. So you would not want to inadvertently, uh, if inadvertently make a, a change, especially as we had in the general. Second, yeah. So I, I save that in, in the general tab. We had in the my preference. Do you want to warn when you edit the transaction? So if you, at least you have that that checked, 
then it's not the end of the world if you um, if you um, if you take off the warning from 90 days back. But if you get no warning on editing a transaction and you uncheck the 90 days, then you're setting yourself up for some trouble. Um, this is, we had the beep. Remember when we when we uh, when we make a transaction, but we turned off the noise. Um, I, last time we discussed the difference if you want to remember the whole transaction for a certain given company or just the, the account. For example, if I get a recurring bill, if most of our bills are recurring, we have car leases and every month it's the same amount. We have a flat rate for a telephone bill. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be going up. And you want to enter in the QuickBooks, um, you would um, say, no, remember not only the account and chart of accounts, you know, the, the utility expense or the telephone expense, remember the dollar amount that save you time. But if you have mostly bills that change in dollar amount, but it's still the same account, then you say pre-fill the account. That's the second one, not the whole transaction. And if you, if you don't, or you could just take off the, you could uncheck the automatic recall as well if you want, it's up to you. Now, this will discuss, I mentioned last time that QuickBooks is very intuitive. There's two options of using today's date as default or the last date as default. So QuickBooks default setting, pun intended, is that you have the last date. So therefore, every time we, we do transactions, when next time you come and you, you, will, you will make a new check, you make a new deposit, we'll use the last date. You could reset the date to, to the, today's date as default. And again, it depends what type of company you are. If you are um, a company where you have a secretary, secretary comes in once a week or twice a week, then most often the activity going in QuickBooks is not today's activity. They're catching up on work. So then today's date is not really necessary. It's you have the last date entered and, you, and you're following what you pick up from where you, where you left off. And if it's, the, if it's one day more, you know, you take the plus sign and you add a date. And if you need to go to today, all you'll do is you press T and you are by today. So it's easier to get to today just by letter T than having a default of today and to get the earlier date, playing around with the Y, the end, to get the beginning of the year, et cetera. But this is, these are all options and everyone picks what is best for them in QuickBooks. Okay, let's go through the list. We'll hold um, my bills. You can, have, you can say your settings whenever you get a bill from a vendor. Is my default, I'll do a pot receipt, or my default is that for the next 10 days I forget about it. Or I, don't, I only forget about it for a week because I entered a bill, it's due in 10 days. So about a week later, I gotta make the check so that it'll be in the mail. There's an option which is useful and it's very important, otherwise it'll defeat the whole purpose. We warn about duplicate bill numbers from the same vendor. The purpose is if you make a bill and you put a bill number, from the vendor, and I, I know some people use the vendor bill number as the bill number, not their own. But you can have two separate reference. You can make a reference number. If I was going to, let's say, enter a bill, come uh, vendors, enter bill, vendor enter bill. So there's the bill on my the reference number, which would match the invoice from the person sending it to me. And here I could select the, ter the terms the same way I sell to my customers. I have 1%, 10 or 2%, like how much is the discount, right? If you pay within 10 days, they get 1% 1, 1 off or 2% off. But if it takes more than 10 days up to 30 days, then I pay the full amount. Or you have to pay it in 15 days or 60 days, or it's 30 days with no discount. So then there's no incentive for me to pay in 10 days. So let me get back to the, so just like you have this in the bill and the settings here, we were in this, I just got out of that. We're the window um, edit preferences. I'll get to that in a second. So warn about duplicate bill numbers because if the purpose of entering the bill with a bill number is that you'll get charged twice, then you want a warning when you enter that bill number twice. Um, the setting which once discussed what happens if you pay right out a check to a company, but you didn't apply it to a bill. 
or if the com or if a company gave you a, a the co if the company gave you a credit, right? So if you would go to vendors and you would write, if let's say you know a kind of Edison gave you ten percent off, gave you thirty dollars, thirty two dollars or eighty cents off, you would right click and you would you would put in a this right chair up in the middle. You could you have the choice once let's see if you enter bill. Is it a bill or a credit, right? So it could be it's from the vendor bill or the, they're giving you a credit and they're applying it to a bill. So do you, could folks want to know, do you want us just to give us a general credit from that vendor or you actually want us to apply it directly to bill? That's what they're asking us in the, this question here. Where edit, preferences, here, automatically use the credit to pay a bill. Why should I leave a credit empty and Pay cash out of my account. So you might say automatically use the credit. Automatically use discounts. Okay. Um, QuickBooks has a calendar. Um, just like the, we told you, wherever you go in QuickBooks, it's a calculator. You could add, you could plus. QuickBooks also has a calendar. So you, you could go into the calendar if you want to see when to write checks. You're not sure what's a weekday. Obviously in computers, you have a, the bottom right corner of your computer, you can bring up a calendar. But QuickBooks wants to offer you that calendar as well. So that's um, an option. Let's see. I see a raised hand here. Oh, the hand disappeared. But um, I guess I don't see any, I don't see any Q and A's right now. Okay, so Q, Q and A is done with. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna do, um, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit more about the, uh, till like 925, I'll do, do some more uh, preferences. And then anyone has questions, Checking. What are the defaults you want on your checking account? Right, you, can, you could have a default. What happens if you have multiple? We know that Control W brings us to write a check, right? What happens if I have more than one bank account? You, collect, you select the default account. When I'm writing checks, I'm using Chase, right? Or, or Citibank, that's the Control W. When I pay bills, maybe I use a different account. When I pay sales tax, maybe I have a separate account because I don't want to overspend, especially if I have like an Amazon account or something which I have a lot of money that you, you take from customers. You don't want to wipe out the account and spend it. And say, oh, where's the money to pay sales tax? And uh, now I owe them. So you might want to take out the sales tax and rather put another company. So then when, in, a rather, in another account, then when you go to pay your liabilities to pay your sales tax, you do that from a different account and etc. So this is different checking account preferences. You, you could have people knowing which is your bank or you can have blank checks which don't show the bank on it, it just shows a dollar amount. Um, they're different. Okay, this, there's a bank feed section. We didn't do this. This is if you're downloading f information from the internet, many banks have them. Uh, those options, you know, the bigger banks like Chase and Citibank are much better equipped to downloading digital stuff as well as American Express, you know, for credit cards. You take a QBO file, we said that's an online account. Now, if you paid for a service, right, let's say Control R is the register. So that's, if you paid for a service, you might be able to just to click, you know, right here you have set up bank feeds on the top of your register, right? You go up to the top of the register, you set up your bank feeds, and then you would have within the, 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 the register window itself, after you set it up, you'll have like a refresh icon which would download data from your bank. 
If you don't want to pay for service, you can do the exact same thing manually. That means you go to your bank, you log into your bank, you, you create your digital file. And we said you can either import it from file utilities, file utilities, import, um, web connect file. That is a QBO file is that you go to utilities, import, web connect. So it's three options within the file. Or you can do it from banking. Banking, bank feeds, import. So it's one step fast. You go import Web Connect, and it looks in your computer where is that file you saved. And you can see that finally in the bottom window here. If you see it, it, show, it should show QBO. QBO is the type of file that's Web Connect. So again, we have ABA, the A is for account, the accountant's version. ABM, the MS for mobile, the portable type. ABX is a is the transfer type. AB, Q, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. QBA, QBM, QBX, QBO. The O is for on, for Web Connect, and QBB. The B is for the backup. That's uh, okay. Just that was a refresher on that one. Okay, so uh, the question we have in Q&A coming in, if we order a payroll check, didn't deduct the taxes, it was all zero, how can you restore it? So you end up copying. Well, the, again, the two taxes which you have to take off, we said Social Security and Medicare, that you have to withhold. Social Security is 6.2%. So if you're ever in a doubt, the way to do 6.2% is you do the check times 0.062. Right, so you, you move the decimal point two spaces back. So you move it one, instead of 6.2, you move it one, one space to the left, that's 0.62. And you move it another space to the left by adding a zero is 0.062. Because that's really what you're doing. You're saying that uh, a percent has two zeros, right? It's, it's one out of 100, there's two zeros there. So you'll take the, whatever the paycheck was, in this case, if it was a $200 paycheck, so 200 times 0.062 would be, um, would be 12, 12.40. That is what you're supposed to withhold for Social Security. And the Medicare is 1.45%. So those are numbers, just like debits and credits, you remember will come to you without no big accounting. Social Security is 6.2%. Medicare is 1.45%. And of course, there's FICA match, which is, FICA is the combination of Medicare and and uh, Social Security, which is matched by the employer. Okay. Um, we're we'll back to the preferences. Um, we have desktop view. Okay, um, okay, we'll, we'll, what are your preferences when you come into QuickBooks? Do you want to come in for where you left off? If you have 20 windows open, you want them to reopen it? Or do you want it not to save your desktop? Want to show the homepage? Every time you come to QuickBooks, you go to the homepage. There are different, or there are different types, or you have multiple windows, right? You want to come in. We have a bunch of windows. You want to have only one window, not multiple windows. So that's up to you. And Finance charges, what happens when you make a, a receipt for a customer and they are late? This you'll discuss with your rabbi, um, the permissibility of it. But you could have, you know, when you agent report, you have a customer who is uh, 60 or 90 or 120 days overdue. You have now, we're having finance charges or interest rates for, for, for this delinquency. And when do you want to charge it? You tell them, you know what, I give you 30 days to pay. So only from that due date is when it starts interest. Or the grace period, which is like a credit card, is 30 days. But when you don't pay in 30 days, then we're going to calculate the charges from the original date. <coughs> Maybe that'll be a given incentive not to forget and you should pay the bill right away. You have these options. Now, we are not credit card you know, companies. So the assumption of QuickBooks is that 
you only charge for when it's due, not you didn't lend them. You didn't, you know, the credit card lent you money, right? Uh, you needed their service. This person didn't you, didn't, you didn't lend them money. And theoretically, yeah, they had to pay for their services. But when they bought something, um, you wanted their service. So they say, you know, don't, don't uh, overdo it. But you can do it as ever you want. Call tonight, Shabbat Mammon works. Okay, um, we went through a lot of the general stuff here. We, we have, uh, again, the portion of an hour, remember we discussed it last time, do you want it as decimal or minutes? And I explained to you why the default will be minutes because sometimes you have portions of units of work and that would be appropriate to have the decimals. Like this, you could see right away that the PRH from Pinchas Tadras was an hourly thing. Um, but when you sell other items, it's uh, like the, the units of service will be uh, with a decimal. Years could be four digits or years could be two digits. It's up to you. Um, okay, we're going to skip integrated applications. Items and inventory we did for the most part. And the same way you have duplicate uh, warnings, warnings for duplicate uh, invoices. You have warnings for duplicate purchase orders. And we, we discussed it at the time, if you want us warnings when you exceed the, the, the quantity in hand or quantity available. Um, I think we had an error that wasn't really working so well, but that's, uh, we could try it again. Then they want to you create estimates. It's like, why do you do a purchase order? Because you want to see, I'm interested in buying an item. What is the price for it? So to the customer, we never did this, but you could create an estimate. It's not an invoice yet. The customer calls up, give me an estimate on a job. You give them the estimate. Later on, you could change an estimate to a sales order. And from a sales order, you change it to an invoice. All right, an estimate is when he's just interested and you show him an estimate. And it's okay, so then you have sales orders, you prepare a sales order. You send it to the warehouse, and it's a fulfillment worksheet, which um, you could look at your own leisure. And when you actually send it out, you create, you create an invoice. It's a, each section is another level. You, you made the estimate, you made the invoice, and now you have statements. We didn't actually, in uh, the next class, we'll do statements. How do you send a, a statement to, uh, it's another type of report, statements on the invoices. Right before you call them up, you want to email them out a statement. It's a month late. So we could do that next time. Uh, right now, we're going to stay uh, and finish off one more line item in the preferences. Um, I still got a question. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah. I was waiting till the end of the class. I was just um, putting my hand up now. Okay, so it's 9.25, so I said I was going to go over to... What? I said I was going to go over to questions at 9.25. Um, anyways, I had spoken to you last time about... Um, I have the 2019 um, QuickBooks, and you said I should email, and I was back and forth with them, and they basically the last email said I should contact you at the end of class with the questions and ask you what to do for a license number. Okay, so again, so, um, in order to open up the, your file. Right, so I, 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 got, I gave over all the licenses to Rabbi Wordy and the secretary. I don't know which numbers were assigned to who, so that's why I, I even said last time, you know, and I had the emails, I don't have licenses. I. I got from the the company gave us licenses, but I didn't assign them. So I, I, I want to inadvertently give you a used license number. So that's why you have to be in touch with Firma. I know maybe this, this, maybe there's a phone number or something. Yeah, no, I called them sometimes. Um, okay, I guess I'll just try again. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Okay, I have MT over here. Uh, 
Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi. First of all, the, the, the course is amazing. Um, I'm trying to, I need to download QuickBooks again since um, it, it expired. I can't activate it any longer. Um, the, uh, I'm wondering one, if I... One second, I expired again. You downloaded from the, the... Which link was it downloaded from? The trial software from the educational software link? Um, the first time around, when we downloaded the first time, I did the Count and Desktop, I think it was. The Count and Desktop. Well, was it a month trial or that was the link that we said that, uh, the way, was, were you issued a license from the, from, uh, from uh, Rabbi Wardy's office or you got the license from the QuickBook website? So I got it from your office. Okay, so, so, no, so then you could still activate it. Even though expired means, because not, not, it's not expired, it was never activated in the first place. If you would activate it, you would get, 100, you'd get 160 days, but you get 30 days even prior to activating it. So you could extend it. So basically you would really get six months. The, again, the, the, the confusion that happens to I apologize what happened at the beginning of the course is that Katzman? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I still don't feel like I totally mastered the um, when something is a credit, when something is a debit, exactly which account you assign everything to. Do you have like maybe like quizzes or something uh, like these type, like, you know, like some homework that I can do where I can right, right. see and figure out how to like get more used to it? Yeah, so first of all, do, do, do you have the slides that we emailed like twice? Or do you have extra email? Yeah, I, I have those slides, but it's, I feel like I need, like, I need to, like, pretend to put in, you know, more entries to, like, get get the hang of it. Just seeing a diagram in front of me, um, you know, it doesn't give, it doesn't give such clarity yet. It's just, like, right. memorizing it, but I want to actually practice it. Okay, so I, what I did say was that um, probably sometime between now and Matzah Shabbos, I'm going to send out 25 questions, um, maybe which, which you could review, and probably at least uh, at least uh, I should say between five to at least five of them, maybe even a third of them will be will be related to debits and credits. And um, I said that I'm going to. Afterwards, I'm going, to, I'm going to load them into Monday's class, which is going to have polling. So you could study that yourself. You could try doing it. You could play around with it. And then we're going to have it again in the next class. We're going to be polling the, most of those questions. Okay. All right. Do you have any questions on today's class or... Do you feel yeah, I mean, I, I asked the question in the Q&A if there's maybe like a report where you can see each item or each transaction of debit and credit that corresponds to each other. I don't know if that exists. Oh, so I, 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 that, that was another, um, another um, shortcut. It's control Y. I tell you that anytime you're on a transaction in QuickBooks and you press control Y, it will tell you what the debit and credit is. That was, that's going to help you explain uh, how, how everything happens. What happens when you, put, uh, when you make an invoice? There's income. So what's the debit? What's the credit? You know, the credit is the revenue went up. What's the debit? The debit is account receivable because it's an invoice. If you, if you get the money, then 
the credit, your credit account receivable because it's not there anymore, and then you debit on deposited funds because that's, that's there. When you move it from deposited funds to the bank, then you credit on deposited funds in your debit bank. So uh -huh. that, that's okay. what huh? Yeah, okay, now no, I, I just tried it out. Okay, I see that. Yeah, that would be very yes, helpful that, that's, to like that's track behind. back and, yes, and see all these transactions. Right. So, so quick, quick book, so this is, you, know, that's, you, you, don't, you don't really have this in the, in the online version, but the, similar to the way Windows and Mac has started or, or the original uh, soft computers, a quick, a quick book's a bunch of windows and it's very, um, use, it's user friendly with icons and pictures and, and et cetera. But at the end of the day, the accounting equation which you gave in the first class is debits, uh, assets equal, equals liabilities and owner's equity. All the debits and assets equal liabilities on, on, on owner's equity unless it's, you could have again, debits and credits on the asset side. You can have, you can have liabilities and you know shifts in shifts in equity. You could transfer from one person to another. So there's always behind the scenes. So QuickBooks makes an easy format. You know, you think you're entering an invoice, and it's a bill. But if you want to understand the accounting behind it, and again, it's not the accounting course, but it's a preview. If you, if you do, if you want to understand debits and credits better, do the control Y on many transactions, and that's the best way to reinforce that skill. Okay, thank Same you. Thing when you get a bill from Con Edison, so you have a, you know, the, the debit is the expense and of, of, electric, of utilities. The credit is the payable because you didn't pay it, right? And then, and then when you pay it, you're gonna, have, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna credit your bank account because you uh, take money out of the account. You're gonna debit the accounts payable because, because uh, before the payable was, was a liability, it was, was a credit, now it's a debit. Right. So every credit has a matching debit. And then I, get, I, I did say also, you have compound entries. Sometimes you have one bill from a company, which is one big payable, one, one credit, but there are multiple debits. It could be an interest expense, expense on top of a, of, a, of a utility expense. Right. So you, you can have two items that make up the debit and only one item would fix the credit. But then again, right. that's, that's not for the purpose. That's very more advanced to have to do compound entries and things like that. Like we, we, we did the, 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 that uh, the person was buying a house. In, in one entry, you're having multiple, you know, where he's putting a down payment, he's paying uh, mortgage tax and interest, he's doing many credits, many debits at the same time. So I, I did one. And I, put, and I sent that out in the email just so you can appreciate what really happens, what you, what you do. But um, yeah, practice, practice makes perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see what else is the question here. <clears throat> okay. And I think MP is back. Hello? Yeah, hi. I'm sorry, we got caught off before. Um, they're asking me, my, or it's asking me for user ID and password. What so am I supposed to put? No, it's underneath that you register. You create, you create a password and user, user ID and password. You, you, you have to create an Twitter account and then you activate the software. Create an account. New Create an account. Is that where I do it? Yeah, yeah. You create. Yeah, create an account. And then they ask me for the. I'm assuming the numbers that Rabbi Wardy gave me, right? No, no, no. no that I, I don't think that the li the license number you put in while you did installation. Now, when you create a Twitter account, it's going to register your software to your account, and it'll be good for another 160 days. Mm -hmm. So I create my own. Okay, thank you. I'll try to do that. You're welcome. Okay, hopefully it works. Let me know. Thank you. Okay. Okay, is there any question here?
Okay, so most of next class, I imagine, will be going through polling, giving people time, and discussing different questions. So if you're still on, I will go through a few more of the preferences, and I will take questions as you go along. And I invite anyone who feels there's a particular area where they feel they need um, some more examples and we should incorporate it into the next class, by all means, let me know and we'll help you out. Uh, next class is the final class of the, of the actual course. And then we'll be having, um, we're having some follow-up classes for preparing for the, for the certification for those who want. Um, we'll, we'll let you know next week. Those classes will probably be a little bit, be shorter, more like an hour and a half sessions, hour and 45 minutes, not uh, running to 1030. And again, even the classes now finish at 945. And then as of lately, um, the instruction, and then we go over to Q&A. So let's see what's going on over here. And so technically the next session is more like full-time Q&A. That's another way of looking at that. Okay, let's go to preferences. We were holding jobs and estimates if, in case we make estimates. Um, if you get, QuickBooks has the option to track multiple currencies. Um, if you only want, if you make bills in dollars and euros, so they tell you, they give you different warnings why you should, you shouldn't do that because um, so letting you know that such an option exists. I'm not going to go into the details of why you should or you shouldn't that you'll figure out. Then we have payments. Um, QuickBooks assumes that when you receive a uh, payment from a customer, automatically you're applying it to invoice and it calculates it. Okay, undeposited funds is the default deposit to account. Because what, what else should you use? It's, you don't assume you receive the payment that end up in the bank. So they use undeposited funds. And you can test it out. What happens if uh, you didn't use undeposited funds? Would you receive a payment equal going, would that go directly to the bank? It wouldn't make sense because QuickBooks would be theoretically putting in your bank account and it's not in your bank account and you'd be writing checks against that money and you'll be bouncing. So with the QuickBooks uses your undeposited funds and honestly, m many people don't even change most of these uh, settings. You know, QuickBooks spend a lot of time developing the program, assuming what's the best options that people would want, but Again, there are things people want to change. Um, payment reminders once a day. They want to get reminded every single day that, I, oh, I have to pay someone. So either pay someone or receive payments. So they do daily at 10 a.m. Come, I guess when you come to office, QuickBooks will send you give you the option, reminder, you have to pay bills or receive, uh, send reminders to customers to pay their bills. Let's look at the options for payroll and employees. So right now we have full payroll. So now that I already, in the, in the software, we activated payroll, and it's giving you many options. You can either offer you online payroll or no pay, or, uh, you can add sick vacation days, you can add, add workers camp, all different types of things you can add to the payroll, but like I said, payroll we finished last time. I have a lot of reminders. You're going down the section, QuickBooks, when you start writing checks, as soon as you go into, into QuickBooks, it's gonna give you a reminder. Okay, do you wanna order new checks? Do you wanna print your checks? whether it's checks for vendors, whether it's paychecks for employees or invoices. So they show you all different types of reminders. They give you options. You say, don't remind me. Do you want a reminder five days before it's due? Right? That means you could prepare checks 
you know, a, a week in advance or two weeks in advance, you didn't, you didn't print it. So five days before the, the date that the check is due, you know, the date that's on the check, QuickBooks, QuickBooks could pop up with a reminder telling you print the check. So it'll be ready in your office. Same thing with paychecks. You know, sometimes if you have different departments, you need one office to print the checks, then you have to, you have to either mail it to the employee or you have to bring it to another office. So QuickBooks likes to be organized. It tells you the default, they'll give you an option. Print the check five days before the paycheck date. I mean, unless obviously you're making the check within the five days, then you're gonna print it right away. But if you printed, you, if we prepared our 626 check today, and you didn't print it, so based on this reminder on 621, it's gonna give you that reminder to print that check. Same thing with bills to pay, gives you 10 days, etc. Reports and graphs. So by default, it pops up as a crawl, right? This is the default. That's the, according to the, to, the counting standards, that's an pr appropriate way of doing accounting, but there's also the cash basis. And if you click in the preferences cash and many companies work in the ca accounting and cash, so that, and, and right now we know that there's a big difference in our company because we have a lot of invoices unpaid. We have a lot of invoices for customers. There's a big difference in the accrual and cash. And you, you, a person can make a mistake and make the wrong reports and, and, they're, and they're, they're sending it to the accountant. And then, you know, if, you don't, if you're not looking for that word, cash or accrual, you might have made a wrong tax return. And you might have uh, paid a lot of extra tax because we, we had a lot of invoices and receivables. So you had a lot of extra money, but you not do it because your company is really taxed on a cash basis. So here's where you would change the setting to cash. So by default, well, this company would be on a cash basis. And then you have name and description or name only or description only. I'm giving you the, the general, the gist of everything which goes on in this preferences there's so much you can do to to change the same thing we have with shipping methods we had over here in the file drop down quickbooks tells you about shipping and you want to, when you make a shipping you want to know which what's what's your default shipping method and what's fob who's you know freight on board who is responsible who's taking the responsibility from or possession of the merchandise when it goes in shipping are you responsible until it gets to the person's house or not? So these are things which you could customize on your invoice. So when the customer gets his invoice or his sales order, or his, um, so you're gonna, he's, gonna, you're gonna, he's gonna see that what the terms are. His terms are 10 days or 30 days. And uh, if he's responsible for, for um, extra, he's responsible for the merchandise early. And the same way we say, just like you have in the bills and you have, in, you have also in the invoice numbers, duplicate numbers. And sometimes people want to inflate their numbers and they just create invoices showing they have a lot of sales and they don't realize that they use the same invoice number. So uh, alternatively, a person might have made an innocent mistake. He created, he created the same invoice multiple times and really it's only supposed to be the one time and he's making less money than he thought initially. So QuickBooks generally has this uh, box checked and you should leave it like that as well. Same thing with sales orders. If you're enabling sales orders, warn about duplicate sales orders. Miscellaneous, we learned about templates and we said how you could customize your invoices with a logo, you could change your addresses. So over here is you would pick what type of, of, uh, of template you want QuickBooks to use. For invoice, you use a packing slip because for, for, for a packing slip, you know, not necessarily any person who opens the box and sees that the items has to know the true value of everything that's there. Yeah, they have to check off that the items are there, but the value could be something which is sent directly to the owner. And it's very possible in certain companies that this is actually proprietary information. 
no one wants their employees knowing what their cost to buying certain items are because everyone's going to scratch it and say, oh, no, let me get into the business. I, I could buy from this company for this price and I'll, I'll become a competitor. So packing slips are packing slips, just showing the items, but the invoices go directly to the, you know, the headquarters, central office. And the same thing for, yeah, for pick lists, which will, which is, not, which is beyond the, the scope of this course. Sales tax, you know, there are some items that you sell or you sell clothing items under a hundred dollars. 100 or so dollars, whatever, the, whatever it is today, $115, whatever. So you don't put sales tax, but generally you, sh you should, if you char charge, if you're a food store, you don't, and you sell food, you're not going to have sales tax. But if you need to have sales tax, you, you want to add sales tax to the bill because otherwise you are going to be absorbing the cost. The assumption will be that when you sold something to the customer, it was including sales tax. And then you just earned yourself a new cost of goods to the tune of 9% in New York City. So make sure that if you're selling an item that needs sales tax, add it to the bill. If you will do the check yes, then you have a whole section. What's your, your you know, what's, how much is your sales tax? Because that varies from county to county. So just making you aware of that option that exists in QuickBooks. Okay, we have um, search, send forms. I, I told you it was a send form. In order to send, okay, we have invoices. In order to email an invoice, you have to set up within QuickBooks email addresses. So you have to have, you have to choose, are you doing webmail or doing QuickBooks email? For the most part, Many companies probably do web mail. They have their own, whether it's their Gmail or their company, website mail. So then you have to add it. You're going to choose web mail and you go down to the window, you press add and you're going to put in what your email is and you choose, you know, the default is Gmail or Yahoo, is the Outlook or another one. And you walk through the prompts. Once you hook up your email address with, with uh, QuickBooks and you get, you get set up also your password because technically what happens when you press send forms, which are sending invoices, sending statements to customers. So QuickBooks, if you're using webmail, is like logging into your website because into your, into your email account because you will go later on and you will be able to look in your sent emails and you will see this invoice that was sent to your customer. So... You would, you would have to enable, you have to get permission to QuickBooks to um, use your email address and to put in the password. Now, one thing you should also know that, that uh, QuickBooks is a third party software. And one of the issues that come up frequently is that QuickBooks has security settings, not letting, you know, not letting third party software that they feel is not the, uh, is not, you know, to their standards. And you would have to go manually into your Gmail settings or to your email provider settings and, and click the option to enable um, third party software or less secure applications, I believe is what it's called. Let less secure ap applications use their email. Otherwise you'll be getting a, an error from QuickBooks many times saying we cannot uh, send the invoice and then it's going to show you again as if you made a wrong password. Maybe you, and you're going to keep on trying again and again, putting in your email and your password and it says we can't do it. And it's not really you didn't put your password in right. It's that QuickBooks cannot get access to your email provider, to your email address. So the error will, might come up as password, but what it really is, Gmail is blocking it. You might get an uh, uh, email notice, a security message from Gmail that a uh, certain third party software for less secure options um, try to access your email account. So that's basically the runaround that you'll get. So that's as far as sending forms. Um, then you have, that's pretty much what we're going to cover here. 
Time expenses also works with data sheets. We already had this. Now, th this is where we had, you know, last time the data sheets go from Monday through Sunday. And, but you could decide that your first day of the week is Sunday and then the week ends on a Saturday. And then and that every week you close. This is up to you. If you remember the example we had from Pesach Tad, this is timesheet would start on a Monday and end on a Sunday. But that's because the default here was Monday. And you have all time entries are billable. We had that option, if you recall. And that is it for, the, for today's instruction. We're going to go back to Q&A for those who have questions, bring it on. And will we have? Yeah, hi. I, um, I wrote it in the q and I'm not sure if you saw it. But um, I know you did in a previous class of how you enter in like credit card statements or purchases. Are you able to go um, just show me how to do that again? Oh, if you ha you just go control A, which is, which is chart of account. And you go into the credit cards account. And, you, and it's like a register. You just add charges. So you only do, you do charges or you do like the statement at the end? Like you do itemize each charge? Okay, so the accountant software, I told you we also have the batch entry, which is a very oh. feature batch entry transactions. And the, we, we explained that time, and that's the difference between the, um, uh, what's it called? You know, if you go, to the, the difference between the banking, banking, you have to do deposits separately and check separately. Right, the credits and the debits really that's what it is separately but on credit cards you can do credit card charges and credits at the same time and on the bottom there are there are two different columns which is uh, i mean not two columns there are two different um, totals on the bottom for the credits and the charges so the charges are a positive number the credits are a negative number and it's very useful because you could enter in this batch enter the batch enter transactions. You could enter your whole statement, and you could cross, before you save it, you could cross reference the total. I, will, I think that's what you were referring to. I did last time. So you have the total charges of the credit card statement to make sure it matches the total charges and total credits. You'll see that your payments, the total amount. Again, if you already wrote a check for your checking account to your. Um, to your credit card, you will not enter the credit again because then you had a double credit. You already put the payment from your checking and already posted to your credit card. But if you did not make the payment yet, then you could put the check, the, the, the credit in your credit card and you'll choose the account, the bank. That's where it's coming from, right? If you, if you are making- Otherwise you put it into the check, into- Like all the charges that go on the credit card, you, you choose the appropriate account. You know, what is it? Is it, is it a office supplies? Is it a, is it a lecture? Whatever, 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 you, whatever you paid in your credit card, you choose accounts. So when it comes to the credit and you're gonna put in a, a negative number because it's not a charge, it's a credit, you're gonna choose the account. Why are you getting this, this credit? You're gonna choose bank because, uh, because the bank put money here. That's why it's a credit. So when you do that, it cross-references the bank right away. So the bank is gonna have the money going out of it. So you'll, you, it's, it's like whoever gets it first. If the bank wrote it, if you put in all your bank, if you did your, your bank statement first and you already put the payment to your credit card, then you won't do the credit card payment here. But if you were doing your credit card first and, you, and you're doing the bank, you're doing your payment to your credit card here, then you, it's automatically be there when you reconcile your checking, checking account. What if you're just doing it like it's always going to come, you're always going to send a checkout, let's say, to or whatever, have like um, send a checkout. You're just putting it in. Into the system. Are you, if you're talking about yourself or an office because. Uh, myself. Yourself. So if you're doing, talking about yourself, in most cases, why would you bother manually entering the transactions? I explained to you about the QBO file. Log into your credit card. Once in three months, for example, or once in two months, depending on how busy it is. No, not really for myself. I mean, for my business. Like right. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm saying, okay, if it's a handful of transactions, five, ten, you know, it's faster to manually enter it. People, have, I've seen credit cards that have over a hundred transactions in one statement. 
you know, people will put their debit cards, right? So the debit cards post to the bank account, you know, so they have so many transactions and, uh, and one of the most common errors that happen is transpositions, which is that um, people enter in dollar amounts, but, you know, they're typing the keyboard and then, the, you know, instead of writing 67 cents or 76 cents or instead of the dollar amount, they, they made an error when they're putting it in. They can't find the, they can't find the error. And they can read it and the eyes play trick on you, whatever it is. But if you will download this from the bank or from the credit card company, you eliminate any errors as far as dollar amounts or, or cents, or whatever how it is. You, how do you download it from the bank? So, so the, you, you go to, when you log into your credit card. No, from the, from the credit card statement. Yeah, yeah. So you, you download transactions, you, you give a certain period. Uh -huh. So that's one thing which I can do in class because. It's something I can demonstrate to an individual person. I can't take any type of personal. Uh, so on the credit card statement, you can download and then and then enter in where you do like an import. You, you download the transactions. It gives you access to, uh, it asks you a date range, and you choose a file format. You can choose either CSV, right, or a QBO file. QuickBooks, what I told you is a QBO file. That's the Web Connect file I showed you. You uh -huh. take it from bank feeds. You take it from utilities. And, right, so um, I can't show anyone's information. I can only, sh for a client, I could show them their own information. I can't show anything to anyone else. But I can right. take those three steps. Okay, and then once you have the file on, like, on your computer, then well, you- so you're importing it. So you, go, you download it to your computer, you go into banking, bank feeds, import web connect file, or alternatively, if you wanna go the long way, I don't know why you would do that, but you go to file utilities import and then a web connect file uh -huh. and then we do that it's going to import the qbo files and then it's, then it's already going to have there's also an option there if you could show bank memos you know but so you're going to have the dates already pre-entered the date of the transaction is there the dollar of the amount of the transaction is there the only thing that you've got to put in is the payee and the account so most of the work is done for you okay fine um Okay, and then also I have a, I'm not sure if like, if, you, if like this is something for an accountant or, but let's say I have um, like a temporary employee, let's say someone is, um, you know, covering for somebody else. How would you enter them in? It's a regular, it's a regular, it's a regular employee check. Regular employee? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. The, the people that they go, they show up for one day, they make their, their 40 or $80 for a couple hours of work. And they, so they're employee. Like taxes wise, they, like yeah, yeah, you with all the taxes. Taxes, taxes, if it's Social like Security and Medicare, everything else. Again, that's if they're an employee. You know, well, they're not an employee, they're just one time. Sometimes, you, you know, it's a delivery person who, who just shows up and they deliver a couple packages for you. And they're not working by you and, and the, the, as long as the, the end result is they got to get the packages somewhere, but they're going with their own car, their own bicycle. So they're, they're offering a delivery service. So then you, you just cut them a regular check, and, you know, for, for, for $40, $100. But you don't put them go. in as an employee. Right. That, that's like a contract. No different than a plumber that came to you to, to, to fix your thing. He's not your employee. He has his own business. He fixes pipes or he does his electrician. He's a vendor, basically. Again, yeah, but you have to be careful, you know, about misclassifying employees. So the, the default rule is anyone that comes to you to do a job is your employee. If you can, if you give them the instructions what to do and how to do it, and you have control over them, especially if they're working in your facility, you know, there, there's certain, there's different tests they have. And for, for employees, it's not just a paycheck, by the way, I told you, you have to have workers come. You know, if you have, uh, if you don't have workers comp, you get heavily fined. So. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So let's see if anyone here has, has uh, questions. Go to QA. Okay. Good answer. So 
no questions, so thank you for joining. And then we'll see you next day. And uh, well, yeah, for those of you that are still here, we got the email. That's